I bring you back to the year 1990. I'm about eight years old. I'm standing in the local culture center in the village I grew up. It's carnival. Yeah. <laughs> and the place is packed with a lot of people. Children, adults, and I'm imitating a famous Flemish comedian. And when I look into the audience, I see everybody is laughing. And it gives me a special feeling. I don't know why, but you know, it, it feels wonderful. Fast forward, 1999. We have a war museum in the village I grew up. And there is a set representing the back house of Anne Frank. And um, the local theater group is performing the diary of Anne Frank. And I am playing Peter van Pels. And again, The place is packed, full of people, total silence. I'm, I'm part of, of, a, of, of, a, of a history everybody knows. And again, it feels extraordinary. Six years later, and I graduate from drama school. And my ambition is crystal clear. I want to be an actor. I want to touch people. I, I, want, I want to move them. You know, I, I want to tell stories that really make an impact. Because I believe that art has the power to, 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 to let people see things they already knew in a, in a total different perspective. And, and I'm lucky because I land in the leading role in a, in a TV series that becomes hugely popular. I succeeded. There's a TV show. There are films, there are movies, theater plays. I perform in a musical in Theater Carré, one of the biggest, largest uh, theaters we have in Holland for four weeks. Show after show sold out. And then I have the honor to work with Alex van Warmerdam. I think, from my perspective, one of the best Dutch filmmakers we have. And the movie, Borgman, has its world premiere in Cannes. Because we're nominated for a Golden Palm. I'm in Cannes, sitting in this movie theater, knowing that Steven Spielberg is also in the building watching the movie. He was the president of the jury that year. Never spoke to him, but Stephen, if you're watching now, you can still give me a call. No hard feelings, yeah. Okay, so I'm an actor. Uh, I tell stories. I perform for full houses. I, I succeeded, right? But then, COVID-19 hits in. Everything comes to a halt. You know, my schedule was wiped, wiped clean. Everything comes and everything stops. And, you know, in the beginning, I had a lot of panic. When could I start work again? But then acceptance came. Maybe it's for the best. You know, I was working for 15 years, one production after another. And, and every time after, after each production, I was thinking, okay, maybe this could be my last. And suddenly I am home with my family and it feels great. I can play with my children. I have dinner in, in the evenings uh, with my family and it's beautiful weather. So I, uh, I have a lot of uh, walking going on, a lot of walking. Yeah, you did the same, I know. But during one of those walks, something especially, uh, something, something happens. I, I think something that really, really changed my world. As I pass by a house, I see a young man crying his heart out. And I know it's a house for people with 
intellectual disabilities. And I've seen him before, I, I've spoken to him occasionally, and I decide to sit next to him and wait till he calms down and stops crying. And I, uh, it takes maybe like five minutes. And then I ask him, Epke, that, that's his name, Epke, tell me, what's wrong? And he tells me he's, he's feeling extremely lonely. The rules in the house are really strict. No contact outside the bubble. And he tells me he needs closeness because he never had it as a child. It gives him a sense of safety. At that moment, I decide to give him my phone number and, and I tell him, just call me every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. And we, and we do. We call every week, 8 p.m. And it adds such a great value to my life. A, a special friendship develops. And when the rules loosen, I invite him to my home and we have meals together. And he connects with my family, with my wife, with my children. He, he, he's, he's, he's watching movies on the couch with my children. He meets my family, he meets my friends. It really adds value to my life and the life of my children. Because someone who's considered different feels totally normal in our lives. So, the end of COVID, and I can start work again. But I, I'm, I'm not happy at all. The thing is, I didn't miss acting. And that's quite strange, because it was my highest ambition for 15 years. So what's wrong? My world was turning upside down. Does it not make me happy anymore? To be honest, it wasn't at that easy, as I mentioned before. It was quite hard. Be because constantly I had to prove myself that I could do it. I, I had to prove that, that I'm good enough. That people, I had to wait uh, till people want to work with me. It, it was not that easy. But, but if, if acting is not my highest ambition anymore, then, then what is? I didn't have any clue. So I started doing a lot of things. But the more I did, the more, I lo the more lost I got. Maybe uh, I need a career switch. Or maybe it's because I'm turning 40. Yes, I'm 41. You know, that's a milestone. Um, so, on my 40th birthday, I received a letter from Epke. I'm going to read a small passage for you. Among other things, he wrote, I feel very safe and comfortable with you. I feel loved. And every time, I feel so warmly welcomed by your family. I am extremely grateful to receive warmth and love from your family. It's something I haven't experienced as a child, teenager, or adult. It's as if I'm able to experience it again in a different family, where I can truly be myself. Again, it hits me. Because for the first time, I really had the feeling I added quality to someone's life. Just by giving him real attention, making a real connection, and he added quality to my life and to my family's life. And I, re I was reflecting to all the projects I've done, I've done before, of all, of, of all years, you know, the work I've done, that I've done. Did I ever make an impact? 
with what I've done? Not, not as I do now. But that was my goal. I, want, I wanted people to see, to look different at things they already knew. Give them a new perspective. I wanted to make real impact. I think we all want to make real impact. But is that possible? And how do we do it? And, and how, do you, how do you measure that you truly are making impact? Do we, we, we want to make a, a positive influence on the world, but is that possible? We have the world in our pockets. The greatest invention of the last century, our phone. And we have access to all the stories in the world. But we are also burdened by them. Because they feel so close, so nearby. All those major global issues. You know, natural disasters. Poverty. War. But how can, we, how can we influence that? How can we make an impact on that stories? I don't think we can. And not even mention the focus on the social media channels where perfect people live, where, where, where we see perfect people in, in perfect lives, in perfect environments. You know, influences that teach us that happiness is tied to perfection and filters. What kind of impact do you make then? If you're an influ influencer with one million followers, what kind of value do you add to, to people's life? You know, the painful truth is that influencers don't focus on the likes they get, but rather the dislikes. I believe in micro impact by making a real connection. So that was the reason I took the, the challenge to be the director of this lo local broadcaster. I, I firmly believe that if you want to create impact, you have to start in your front yard. Local media is really important because we can make connection and we can help fixing social issues in our city. Now, if I tell a story about people living in poverty, lonely people, homeless people, it's about people we might encounter. It's about people in our streets. It's about people we might even recognize. I believe then you can feel the impact the story has. I think then you're able to, to make difference. I plead for micro impact. You know, people are motivated by experience of success. So if you donate 10,000 euros to Turkey because there's the earthquake, it's, it's noble, it's generous, and don't get me wrong, that's really important. Don't stop doing it. But be honest. Do you truly feel the impact it has? If you bring food to a family in your street, you know they're poor and they wouldn't have food otherwise, you will feel the impact because the gratitude of the family will add value to your life and you add value to their lives. I try to make a millimeter impact 
every day. And because I succeed, I keep on doing it. If I make one, mil one millimeter of impact every day, that's seven millimeters at the end of the week. If we all do that, and we were eight billion people, we make 56 billion millimeters of impact. That's 56 kilom 56,000 kilometers in one week. A trip around the world is only 40,000 kilometers. So if we want to create global impact as human beings, we only have to make minuscule steps to create that and to succeed. So let's start doing that. I challenge you. In a few moments when you leave this room, don't look at the world immediately through your phone, but look around you. Ask someone how his day was. Smile to someone. Sit next to a person who is lonely. And I promise you, you will feel the tangible impact you made. And in that millimeter, true happiness lies. Thank you.